Are you ready to become awesomer? Hello, everyone. My name is Umar Hamid. I'm your host on the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their tips, strategy, and advice on how you can become better, stronger, faster. Just before we get started, I've got a question for you. Do you have a negative voice inside your head? We all do, right? I'm going to help you remove that voice in under 30 days guaranteed. Not only remove it, but transform it. So instead of the voice that sabotages you, there's one that propels you to much higher levels of performance and success. There's a link in the show notes. Click on it to find out more. All right, let's get started. Hey, everyone. It is springtime in Toronto and uh, so excited to be... uh, talking real estate because, you know, this is the season where things really start moving and people are looking to kind of new beginnings. And today we have uh, Mario here with us, Mario Armani. He's in Toronto, Canada. Let's bring him on stage. Mario, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me, Umar. So like everything else in the world, uh, real estate is probably the easiest business to come into. And if you have the right mindset and the right skill set, it can be a great career. But uh, if you don't have that, then it can be a struggle. So you started 19 years ago. What were your thoughts about what this industry would be like and what did the reality turn? Uh, when did you kind of face reality and go, oh, wait a minute, this is different than I thought. So talk to me about how you entered the industry and what you thought it would be and what it turned out to be. So I got into the business at the time where all of these HGTV shows were kind of popular. A lot of people were starting to flip homes and all this. And Mm -hmm. I figured to myself, you know what, I'm going to flip homes as well. I want to try to do that for some extra income. So I had a very well paying job um, and I just decided this is a good opportunity where I can make more money. Um, in the process of this, I felt, you know what, to get that little bit of an edge, I'm also going to get my real estate license because this way I can scope out my own properties. I don't, I'm not really depending on another person. Mm. I'm going ahead and let's say if I see something, I can go look at it, book my appointment, do my own research, uh, put in an offer, save the money on the commission. When I sell the property, I can, cause at the end of the day, it's all about profit and loss, right? Um, I quickly learned that that was a very, very difficult business, uh, lost a lot of money on a couple of projects, but the ball started to kind of, uh, pass around friends and people that knew me, they knew that I had my real estate license and they kind of started asking me, Hey, uh, would you mind taking a look at this? Would you mind taking a look at that? And it got to the point where I started making a little bit of money with it. And I kind of, uh, was put in a position where I had to make a call where, where, where I said to myself, okay. I could make continue making pretty great money. My job was not that stressful, but it kind of had a ceiling. Um, or I can go into this field of real estate where the sky's the limit. And I've always been the type of person that anything I do, anything I put my mind to, I've always succeeded. I've always excelled at it. And I just have a, I'm not going to quit attitude. And I just jumped head first into it. And uh, it's been 19 years now. Brilliant. And uh, you were talking about those TV shows. I could see it, you know, uh, come see houses with Mario Armani. I mean, that's like a cool freaking name. You look good too. I could see it in your future. So what's one of the early lessons you learned in real estate that served you well? There was a big difference between going full-time and part-time, um, or should I say part-time to full-time? Because when you're part-time, you're kind of, doing your own thing and you just you just get phone calls you don't have a system you don't have a process you don't really have a way to do things and it was a very um it were it was a very quick shock when i realized that going from part-time to full-time was extremely difficult because my phone start stopped ringing and it stopped ringing very quickly so an early lesson was the fact that you need systems in place if you don't have systems in place you're basically only as good as your last sale Absolutely. And uh, uh, one of the things that salespeople do really, really well is like, uh, Armani, you know, I don't need a system. You want me to follow the system or you want me to sell? And this is like uh, urge to get freedom. But people that are really successful in this business 
have a system and they're all they're always monitoring it to see where they can tweak it and just make it better. So why don't you walk us through uh, your system for generating leads? Uh, what does that look like now? And uh, uh, let's uh, dig deeper into that. And then I'll ask some questions around that because I think that's one of the areas where a lot of realtors fail is when they don't have enough customers in the system. Yes. Yeah, so there's uh, various ways that, and this is a question that um, I get asked all the time. I have to say it's the, it's the number one question. Where do you find your clients? So there, there's different systems that a realtor can use. Uh, one is basically be, uh, 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 building an organic reach. Um, that does take a little bit of time um, because you have to connect with people. This is something that I've done um, and how I've actually attained my clients. So I built relationships with not just clients, but people that eventually turned into clients. So in other words, it's kind of like digital networking. Yes. Um, and that's basically what it is. One of the things that um, I don't do that I should do a lot more of um, is actually networking in person, going to events, uh, mingling, schmoozing. It's something that I never do. So I'm kind of the complete opposite of what they tell you that a realtor needs to do. I don't right. do those things. Now, I do feel that those things are very, very good. And they're actually, it's kind of like a chip uh, in my armor, if you want to call it, that I should be doing more of. Um, but one way is to do it organically through social media, which is well, what my strategy has been. The other strategy is basically the old school tactics of farming, door knocking, um, putting out flyers. And as, men, as much as people feel that that is not effective, I can tell you right now that some of the uh, busier agents in the GTA, that's actually what it is that they do. So I'm going to tell people uh, in a moment uh, a secret formula for getting a ton of clients. And this is something realtors don't want to do, but the best realtors do. But before that, I'm going to go to one of our sponsors and let's take a look at what they got. Ready to let go of anxiety, let go of uncertainty, let go of doubt. Mindset Boosters gives you the ability to decide how you act and feel in any situation. Ready to take charge of your mindset? Go to MindsetBoosters.com. Well, if you want to take charge of your mindset, Mindset Boosters is a perfect way to do that. But here's the thing that I find a lot of really successful realtors do is open houses. And a lot of people are like, I don't want to do an open house. No one's coming. But uh, people that are doing it are picking up one or two leads each time they do an open house. And when they look after those people, uh, they get more opportunities to have more open houses. And uh, I've got uh, one of the realtors that I know, he's asking in the office, who's got an open house that doesn't want to do it? They'll put their hand up and start getting leads. Your thoughts on that, uh, couldn't agree with you anymore. You are bang on 100%. Um, I felt like I was a king of open houses uh, previous to COVID because, um, like you mentioned, I used to pick up at least one or two leads. Now, there's a very big misconception amongst the public that, um, and amongst sellers, oh, are you going to be having an open house? They're very, very prone to thinking that the open house really does promote their property, that the open house really does sell their property. But in fact, I think some, uh, the, uh, some recent stats that I saw was that in terms of all of the overall sales, only 1% of sales do happen through an open house. Now, I would say 1% is better than 0%, but at the same time, the major purpose of an open house for a realtor is not necessarily to sell that property, even though that is the intention. You should be obviously doing an open house, every single open house with that mindset of today, I will sell this house. But in reality, you're doing that open house because you want to meet neighbors, you want to meet clients, you want to network and connect with as much people as possible. And if you do it properly and you market it properly, not only will you be able to tackle that organic reach, but you will also be able to attain that face-to-face -face conversation that you want with a person. And that's where your salesmanship comes into play. Absolutely. And we'll talk about salesmanship in a moment because it's really critical. But I think there's four reasons open houses are really, really good. Uh, number one, it allows the nosy neighbors to come in and take a look at the property if they haven't been there before. Two, makes the homeowner feel really comfortable like you all the other stuff is in the background. They can physically see you're doing something. 
Number three, it allows you to see clients. And I've got some realtor clients that they've got another house close by that's similar to the house they're in. And if they get somebody coming in saying, you know, yeah, I kind of like this. It's not quite right. Say, hey, when I finish this open house at four o'clock, I'm visiting this other property. Would you like to see it? And it really allows them to actually get uh, show that potential client another property that actually might get the realtor to get clarity on what they want because they've got these, uh, you know, to figure out the third point in space, you need two points, you know, and I think that's really useful. And three, generate leads. Uh, but you mentioned salesmanship. And in our society, uh, Mario, uh, sales is a dirty word. Even salespeople yes. want to go out to the store and they're looking for something and they need help. And someone says, can I help you? It's like, oh, no, just looking. And so how do you keep your sales skills sharp? So I think open houses um, are fantastic. I recently did an open house about three weeks ago, and it was one of those moments where um, I felt really proud of myself. And I think that it's also very important um, as individuals to also acknowledge um, our, our strengths um, the same way that sometimes we only notice our weaknesses, right? And right. why I mean that is because at the open house, uh, we had already uh, sold the house coincidentally the, the previous evening. Uh, I have a newer realtor that oh, wow. joined the team. So um, it's very difficult. I've been in this situation before where I've sold the house right before the open house and I'd canceled the open house. And basically at that point, uh, all the marketing and everything you did, no matter, even if you say the open house is canceled, because you do get a few phone calls, you always get people showing up at the house and you they feel like you wasted their time because they drove all the way out there. Uh, people that specifically were not nosy neighbors. So from a rule of thumb, I said to myself, if this situation ever happens again, which it had, uh, and it had happened that particular time again for another time, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the open house. But at the same time, I also wanted to do it because I wanted to uh, show the new agent how to do an open house properly. And why I say that I was very proud of myself, because that's kind of way, where you realize, where you do sharpen your skills, because that's a social setting. You don't know these people. These people don't know you. You're basically, you're basically you're networking, you're talking, you're, they're getting to know you, you're getting to know them. But I think the key to being a great salesman is not being the type of salesman where, can I help you? Uh, do you want to buy this? That's what a typical salesman would do. What you want to do is you want to indirectly sell somebody. You, people want to work with their friends. And if you make people feel comfortable, they're going to be okay. They're going to ask you the questions. They're going to, they're going to want you to tell them the information as opposed to, let's say, hey, I can do this, I can do that, give me your number, give me your email, I want to contact you. That kind of aggressive behavior is not received very well from any client. So this is the difference between being a salesperson and indirectly having that salesmanship ability to close somebody without putting that pressure. So it's just, uh, I agree. Uh, I was just reading something earlier today. It was about... Uh one of the oldest synagogues in uh, Europe and they have this uh, one prayer in the day. And because a lot of people are moving away from there, the rabbi there, whether somebody's in the, uh, uh, the temple or not, they still do it because they made a commitment to do it and uh, they're going to do it. And I think being a salesperson, if you made a commitment to have the open house, being there shows uh, being a professional, and B, when a client comes in and it's like this house already sold, is also great testimony to, you should work with me. We get sure. this done. And I think just adding to your, you know, don't be a pushy salesperson. Don't be too salesy. I'm a firm believer in the intent that you have. And if your intent, and it sounds, uh, this is what I heard you say, is my intent is to help these people find the perfect home, whether it's through me or not. And is building that trust and friendship. And a byproduct of that often is they're going to hire you. But if the intent is, I'm going to make them my friend to sell them something, uh, sometimes people sense that. So if you are selfless in what you do in a professional and you help people get insights into you know, that transaction, uh, they'll be your friends forever. And they'll be a great referral source. All of the new clients that I meet, um, where let's say I meet them completely out of the blue, just as a silly example, mm -hmm. I met them at the gym. 
it, you're just having a conversation. Um, when people see that you're giving them information, you're trying to offer them value. You're not really trying to close them. You're just genuinely trying to be helpful. Those are the people that want to work with you as opposed to, let's say, canvassing for clients. Those mm -hmm. clients are now canvassing you. That's why a lot of top salespeople, they're constantly putting out content. They're constantly giving value because people now, they want to work with those type of individuals. Absolutely. So once you've got, uh, let's say, someone that wants to buy a house, uh, what's the process you take them through to really understand what they want? Because oftentimes they don't clearly know themselves what they want. And it's the uh, trial and error of seeing houses to kind of really figure it out. How do you shorten that uh, sales cycle to really get them to understand this is what we want? Because there's usually, you know, uh, two people buying the house. So how do you navigate that and help them get clarity on what they want so it makes your job easier and more importantly, you help them find the right house? The question is very difficult because um, in theory, I could answer it. But the reality is, is that now because of the market being so expensive, especially here in Toronto, Canada, okay. the market's really, really hot once again. Sometimes people don't have a choice because of the price point where they're at. So mm -hmm. I always gauge, okay, what is it that you qualify for? Why don't we spend some time looking at what you do qualify for and what you can actually get for that amount of money? And then I think it's very, very difficult, a different when people see with their own eyes, what they could actually get, what a property is not only listed for, but what a property has sold for. And this does take a little bit of time. And I feel that a lot of realtors are very eager to get people to a showing and they don't want to invest that time because A, it takes time from them and mm -hmm. B, more importantly, the more educated a buyer or a seller is, the less the salesperson can kind of sway them how they want. In my particular case, I don't want to sway any client. My job, I feel, is to educate every single buyer and seller to the best of my ability so that buyer and seller can be knowledgeable enough to make the best decision for themselves. Am I going to go ahead and give them a suggestion on what I feel they should buy or sell? Yes, I absolutely will. But at the same time, I do have to take the time to educate that person accordingly. And that's how I feel they're ultimately going to make the best decision. And even and it's going to be the decision that they felt OK with. And down the line, they're never going to be able to say, you know what, Mario didn't explain this. He didn't show me this. He didn't share this. They're going to be able to live and die with their decision and they're going to be happy and at peace with it. And I think that's the most important thing when it comes to selling somebody a property. Nice. So when uh, when we look at Mario, although we haven't met yet, uh, let's say five years ago, that Mario probably sucked compared to this Mario before me because you got more experience and you have done, you know, probably learned more stuff. So what are you trying to improve right now that, you know, we see Mario five years from now that is better, stronger, faster? Like what are the areas you're trying to improve in you to make you uh, – uh, Mario 3.0. So one of the uh, probably going to sound pretty crazy, but I feel like I'm sometimes very, very nice, too nice. Mm. And that's a problem. Um, to, it's a problem to some. Uh, I actually met this was going back about 10, 11 years ago. I met with a very, very big realtor, probably one of the top three realtors here in Toronto lists a lot of 10, 50 Maybe million dollars. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, who is this person? I can't, oh. I, I, I don't want to mention him okay. because no what he said, I kind of uh, felt it was a little bit strange, but what I loved about the gentleman was that he was an open book. Now it was kind of funny because the impression that I felt about him prior to meeting him was one. And then after meeting him, I, I said to myself, I'm like, this guy's just, he's all business, doesn't care. There's really no compassion. And I didn't understand it because I always like I've, I've been in sales my entire life, even before being a realtor, I've been in sales and I've always felt that you have to care. And I'm always the type of person that's going to care legitimately. And I saw this guy 
multi 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 millionaire uh extremely well off and i'll never forget what the guy said to me he said do you want to make friends or do you want to make money mm. and leaving that guy's office i'm like you know what the guy was really a jerk he, he like like he doesn't really care like it's crazy that people use him and support him and they don't really understand who this guy really is and what he does for people but at the same time now 10 years later i start to see that he's kind of right in a way because at the end of the day you can only be as nice of a guy but when that happens a lot of people take advantage of you and that's something that's very unfortunate so one of the changes that i'm trying to make is just kind of having a little bit more of a business mindset where you're doing things in a way that i'm not saying that it benefits you like i would never lie to a client to sell them a property or anything like that but sometimes you do have to make the right decision and that sometimes is let's say not taking on certain clients because they're not the best fit for your business that's that would be let's say a prime example so in other words just trying trying to be a little bit more selective on who it is that you work with and who fits your brand because at the end of the day if you're working with people that are not meant to work with you you're also doing a disservice to that client because it's not the right fit for them either and you want that experience for them to also be pleasant but that's something that you have to kind of make the call and i think that uh throughout the years you kind of obviously you need to have the the amount of business to be able to let's say turn down a client as well right Absolutely. One of the things you talked about was, you know, that need to be liked. And a lot of uh, leaders of companies have that issue as well, where uh, part of their mindset knows exactly what they need to do. We need to kill this project and move over here. That's the right decision for the business, but they're humans too. And they've got this other part of their psyche that I don't want to be a jerk. So I'm going to let uh, John continue this project for another three months. So he proves to himself it's not going to work. And that gets in the way of their decision making. And one of the things that we do in our company is very much figure out what belief is driving that need to be liked. We go in and we transform it. And it doesn't turn the leader into a mean person, but they have the ability to make decisions that are crisper and faster rather than let things extend. Because, you know, we're all human beings and we all want to be liked, but some people uh, let that need to be liked get in the way of doing what's best for them and yes. the customer. And you always want everybody to be happy, but at the same time, uh, there's also a fine line where you have to draw that line in the sand where you say, okay, I understand that your happiness is important, but my happiness and my well-being is also important. And the problem with being a real estate agent, you're always being pulled in every direction. So you can have a bad client and he may ruin your mental well-being. So now when you're dealing with your three or four or five other clients, now you're not in a proper headspace to be able to serve those clients in the in the way that they truly deserve. So you're kind of like you're missing out on the good because you're hanging on to the bad. And that's more of I guess it's more of a life lesson, not necessarily a real estate agent lesson. But um, yeah, I it's feel that um, all one and the same. We're human beings. Yes. Uh, uh, so before we part company uh what's one piece of advice that you've gotten uh that serves you really well as a realtor you just have to work hard and i know that's very broad uh and vague but what i mean is is that there's going to be days where you're going to wake up and you're going to have nothing to do or you're going to feel like you have nothing to do but action creates reaction. So there's always like, there's always things you can clean up. There's always things you can do better. There's always things you can kind of reinvent. I think that with real estate and this career, it's the type of business that you always have to be thinking no matter what. And it is a very big problem because from a mental health aspect, it really hurts a lot of realtors who are this way. Like I'm this way. And I know that I struggle from a mental health aspect because I'm constantly trying to evolve. I'm constantly trying to grow my business. I'm constantly trying to reinvent the wheel, but it's very difficult to do that. Now, a lot of people, like you mentioned earlier, Coach Umar, that they get into the business and they want that freedom. They want that, oh, you know what? Uh, I want to be my own boss. So they think that you can make your own hours and kind of pick the job up and, pick, and put it down whenever you want. 
But once you start getting busy, that's not the, that it's not the case at all because people want things right away. You kind of have to be available to when they're available. There's obviously like there's there's a, a lot of compromises that you do make with clients, right? But ultimately, you're at their disposal because they can't view a home at the hour that you want sometimes. Sometimes you have to do it when they are available. And if that means mornings or evenings or weekends, whatever the case may be. So when I say that you have to work hard is you have to con consistently be evolving and pivoting and just growing. Because if you're not doing that, unfortunately, the competition is just going to eat you away. So I'm going to second that. I've heard this, like we've done uh, 302 interviews uh, in this podcast and uh, some real giants. And one of the themes that recurs a lot is hard work and how important that is to do. And uh, it kind of reminds me of Elon Musk. Either you love him or you hate him, but no one can ever accuse him of not putting in the hours. Like I personally love him. I actually uh, published a video. This was about maybe two months ago mm -hmm. on how much I admire Elon Musk. And like you said, love him or hate him. You can't knock the guy for be for not being a visionary. The guy's like, you know what? I have an idea. I'm going to figure it out how to do it. And the guy works at it like all day long. Um, I know he's catching a lot of crap right now with this whole Twitter situation. But at the end of the day, the guy saw a company that is mismanaged. And he's not in business to lose money. He's in business to do something great. So he's looking at things that just don't work. And sometimes the right decisions are the hardest decisions. And But he's doing it for the benefit of the company. I don't think he's uh, voluntarily trying to sabotage the company. And nobody can really say that the guy doesn't know how to run a business because the guy's a very successful entrepreneur. Yeah, and realistically, uh, Twitter should be dead by now because... Uh three quarters of staff is missing, but somehow it is operating really, really well. And it just kind of uh, shows you how much fat was there. Well, yes. Mario, uh, what's a, uh, before we part company, uh, what's a question you have for me? If I didn't have one, uh, but now that you're going to put me on the spot, I'll think of one quickly. Uh, what do you feel realtors are mostly lacking? experienced realtors. So I was doing this uh, workshop. Uh, there was about a hundred realtors in the room and I had asked them this question. I said, you know, there's different aspects to the real estate business and we're good at some areas and not so good at others. And fear comes up in some areas like asking for referrals. Like for some people it's easy to do for other people. It's like I could do it to strangers, but not to people that I know. And so I asked him, you know, uh, think about where fear enters your world and how many transactions could you be doing extra a year if you were fearless in that area? And the answer that came back was two extra transactions a month would happen if I was fearless in whatever area they think they're holding back. So I think one of the things we need to do as professionals, as human beings, is when fear comes up, we're trained to shy away and stay away from it. When the very moment of fear is when you are at your physical strongest and best to handle it. That's the biological reaction to a new challenge that we need to retrain ourselves when fear comes not to pull back, but to move forward into the breach. And uh, the reality is, Mario, you should be dead by now. All the things that you feared, uh, financial collapse, whatever, none of that happened. And so what we need to realize is, A, we're not going to die, and B, fear is our friend to move forward. If I could help realtors do that, uh, they would get an extra two transactions a month minimum. And in Burlington, Ontario, with their average price, that means an extra $300,000 in their pocket that year. And so... I want the world to be fearless is thank you for asking that question. And uh, thank you for being on the show today. It was uh, really enjoyable. And uh, we're going to put all your contact information in the show notes with the links. But uh, why don't you tell people uh, where people can find you? Best place to find me is on Instagram, ArmaniSells.ca, TikTok, ArmaniSells.ca. You can also um, like my Facebook page. I put out a lot of content on, on YouTube. Uh, once again, you can search Mario Armani Real Estate. 
And uh, I'm always happy to help, happy, happy to give guidance and education. And that's, that's kind of um, my, my MO. I like to educate buyers and sellers. And uh, to me, attention to detail is everything. Brilliant. Stay tuned. Uh, after We'll do the after show after this. Just before we go, let's uh, bring this up. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming, and that is the fastest way to get better results. 